All right, everybody, welcome back to High P at Home. Uh, or Sorry, I just gave the wrong title. We should start this whole thing over and just scratch it. This is the Coach's Corner. Hmm. Coaches are at home, too. So, Coach's Corner today. <laughs> Good start, Kerry. Um, today, I am joined by Mr. Kevin Dunn. Kevin, how you doing? Doing well, Kerry. And we have a very special guest, uh, Clemson's assistant coach, Mr. Jesse Ortiz. Jesse, what's up? Doing good, Kerry. How you doing, man? Great. Um, Jesse, we're going to do a deep dive into some nerdy volleyball stuff, which I'm really excited about. I know you are, too. Um, really talk about stats and how we use them and what we should do with them uh, for our coaches. But I want to get, uh, get people to know you a little bit, a little talk about your journey. We met not at the beginning of your journey, but, you know, in close to, you know, for both of us, it was an early part of our coaching journey. Uh, give us a little idea of how you got started and, you know, a couple of stops along the way and how you ended up at Clemson. Yeah, I um, So I was a immense, I, I grew up in California, Hawaii. I'm a West Coast kid. I mean, that's, I was on the beaches and my dad was a Navy guy. So um, I was always kind of around volleyball. Not that it was like an obsession of mine. I just always, always kind of played. And uh, um, I went to school up in Northern California, a school called Sonoma State. I played in the men's club team there. Um, and I just got hooked. I just, I was so addicted to it. I started playing all the time. And um, I mean, I'm 5'10", so I, you know, I was little man, like just so geared up on trying to be a, develop my aggro and get my animal up and competing. And it was, uh, it was a great vessel for me. And it was something I could get better at. And um, I, I was, I fell in love with it. So um, there came a point where I transitioned to coaching and, and my coach on the men's team, actually, she got a job in a, a school in California. And so upon graduating, I took over. And I think like a lot of, uh, well, I'll just say, uh, I thought I knew a lot about volleyball, a lot. I mean, I was a player, obviously, you know, and I can remember, I can remember when I transitioned to the high school game, I was coaching a freshman team. And I remember mad dogging the little old lady like this little ancient lady who was like glasses and barely hobbling around whose team was on the other side and i'm like man i'm gonna work i'm gonna destroy her i'm gonna you know just it's a bad day for her and her team absolutely systematically just whooped my team up and uh, i think that's just a, it's, it, those are great uh spots in my journey because you get to reflect a little bit and i think if you're someone who's going to be self-reflective you sit there and go well how is that possible and of course it was well i'm not playing so I'm not up against her. She's not trying to stop me. It's her team, right? And, um, you know, I, I did some high school ball and, and uh, of course, was involved in club ball. I was at a club called uh, uh, Empire Volleyball Club, Northern California. And um, I, uh, my guys, my head coach's name at the time was Bear Grassel. And Bear was a forward thinker, unbeknownst to me. I just followed this guy because that's what you're supposed to do. And uh, I think I was like a lot of other coaches where you look online, you find stuff, you listen to anybody, whatever they say you do. And um, I had this thing though, that was happening during my club journey, which was, I wasn't winning at the beginning. I mean, I would just get whooped. And my, my teams all worked extremely hard. I had all my drills, I would obsess on them. I would, you know, we'd go in through them, I'd just do it. And we were systematic, we'd do it every year, year in, year out. But my teams didn't win. And I think I took a step back at one point and was going like, what's really going on? Um, around that time, Bear uh, said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna send you somewhere this summer. And I'm like, where? You know? And they're like, we're gonna send you to, uh, they, oh, they called it Chris Lamb Immersion School. <laughs> and- uh, I think I've they, been to that school. Yeah, you've been there, that's where I met you. <laughs> uh, and, and, and of course, Lambo, and that's what we call him Lambo. So Bear and Lamb are my two, uh, mentors and so lambo had like oh well, let's do this journey where you're going to drive here and drive here meet this guy i mean and looking back i was like man i don't want to drive for four days just to get to your school you know like but looking back i probably should have done that i mean that would have been awesome um but i go to chris's uh camps and if you know chris uh I, the first time he sees me he's like scowling at me um and i'm like intimidated like to no other um and then watching this guy go, um, I don't think I thought he was anything special. I just thought he was a regular coach, but he was a, D, a D1 coach. And um, I, I was impressed and I got hooked. I wrote everything down. 
So I was going back year in and year out. I would stay with Chris at his house. We'd, uh, we would do yard work, dig ditches, work on his car, clean his garage. And then at night, I we would sit in a hot tub. Um, other people were there too. It wasn't just like me and him in a hot tub. But we'd sit in a hot tub. We just talked volleyball. And uh, it was, God, it was, it was, it was tremendous. And Chris, um, Chris introduced me to a book called Moneyball. And this is 10 years before a movie came out. So, um, and I read that thing cover to cover probably a dozen times. And now I'm more an audiobooks guy. So between reading and listening, I've probably listened or, and read that thing over a hundred times, literally. I'm, I'm not kidding. It spoke to me. Um, that along with Outliers were great books for my progression. Um, we had some good years at Sonoma State. We recruited well. And uh, it wasn't like we were, we, we, we put our players in positions to be successful. But we had great players, obviously. And then um, I had the chance to get my master's degree. And so I had to go to Ferris State, a place in Big Rapids, Michigan. Um, and it was still in Division Two, And that's where Sonoma was. And I was, like anybody else, itching to get into the big leagues, want to be in Division One, And um, I couldn't break in. And I just thought the reason why is because all these D1 coaches just know so much more than me. And so I kept on obsessing and obsessing about all these little things and, and measuring. Chris told me to measure and Moneyball is talking about all these measurements and things you can look at and scenarios and events. And um, anyway, I go to Ferris and uh, it's, it's not big. There are no rapids to speak of in big rapids. This is a desolate place coming from wine country, California, uh, which is really affluent and gorgeous to yeah, uh, so it was a different, it was a, you know, culture shock for me. Um, we had some great years there, and, and Tia, my, my next head coach, was uh, really open to some of the things that I was bringing, and uh, I've made my mark. Um, you know, coaching guys, I started off as an, as an offensive coach because there's no defense. We were really good at serve receiving and, and attacking, which goes a lot really well in the men's game, um, but then I made the transition to the women's game, and, and so those were it was just, you know, part of what you learn and you have to find the discrepancies between the two and there are differences for sure. Um, we had some good years at, at, at Ferris and the quirky kind of ways I was talking to Tia about these stats and how to use them um, got brought to Miami as well. And we made that transition at Miami of Ohio, which was my next school under Carolyn Condit. Uh, had some great years there as well. Um, I was very fortunate. All, all these places had unbelievable talent. Uh, so I really feel like I've been extremely lucky in my journey because I, I wasn't walking into programs that didn't have anything. They were all loaded, you know, um, with, with their own measures of success as far as how they finished. Um, and, and those years all afforded me a chance to go to Michigan State. Um, so I went back to Michigan and of course it's the Big Ten and um, that's its own fun, you know, dynamic, uh, being, a, being a level that has a, a freakish athletes um, and good volleyball, I mean, depending on where, what schools you're at. Um, and then currently I just had a chance to kind of take a step back from that and, and get into more of an environment where here in South Carolina, it's gorgeous every day, there's no snow. Um, I, I really, I'm working with friends who I, I've known for a while. And so I feel like it's just very uh, healthy. And uh, I, I love the fact that I'm still in the power five and um, I'm, I'm a workaholic. So this is still, um, it feeds that. So that's, that's a, that's been my journey, a long-winded, uh, brief uh, tale of how I've come up in volleyball and, and got to the place I'm at right now. Now it's a, it's actually a really cool journey. I mean, I remember those days in, in Wichita, Kansas, with with Lambo, and I mean, I don't think anybody analyzes anything more than he does. I mean, he took he took uh, uh, that game he took that game show. Uh, oh, let, let's make a deal. And he just started talking about stats and how, how you figure that stuff out. I was like, my mind was just blown. Um, well, real quick, because this is going to your coaches. I just want to say, I remember one time, this is off topic, but I remember one time coaching uh, at the tournament team camp at, at Wichita State. And me, and me and you were going up against each other. And I don't know if you remember this, but like we were trying to serve as fast as we can because we were behind. And uh, I remember you guys were getting heated because we were like, you know, you guys weren't getting set. We're serving the ball before. And then some parent like gets the ball and like just starts holding it. And I remember people are freaking out. And I remember some kid was yelling at me from your side. And I'm like, hey, it's going to be. And you're like, don't talk to my kid. Don't talk to my kid. And uh, 
I remember going, all right, everybody, easy. Like, I slowly walked to the parent. Can you please give me the ball? I threw it over to my player. I said, let them get set before we serve it. <laughs> you were a little red because you were, you know, competitive and stuff. Uh, I never forget that. I thought that was awesome. It was like, uh, I guess we were in team camp. To you had to win team camp. Like, that was a big deal. It's a huge deal. You guys won that set. Yeah, won that match. So. <laughs> um let's uh let's dive into stats you mentioned you, you mentioned it briefly um just in general uh, i think you know we'll we'll get into the minutia of it and the, the different different ways that maybe club coaches high school coaches college coaches are using them um you mentioned men's volleyball how there's different different metrics to to talk about just in general what are you what are you thinking about on a day-to-day -day, week to week season-long basis when you're thinking about statistics yeah i i think i'm more into um analytics these days and, and, and let me tell you analytics involves statistics it's the collection of stats and data it's the interpretation of that collection of stats and data and it's your ability to share it with your group because otherwise it's just a bunch of numbers if we're just looking at it and so um what i think about these days is, is how to keep on improving um my process of, of collecting data um, and, I, and I've come from since I came from club and then it was in the stats and then went to division two where I didn't have tons of resources. I didn't have a data volley guy in most of the teams that I've ever been on. So, um, and that's its own microcosm and, and we might be able to talk about that a little bit, but um, I, I think I'm looking at constant ways of, of not only collecting it. And, and then the other side is what, what if this actually matters? You know, I think we see a box score and we rattle off what we think is important. And um, I'm getting, you know, my, we had 2.4 blocks a set, you know, or, or we're digging at uh, 14 digs a set. That's amazing. Or is it, you know? So I think some, in some of the stats we have, I think some of them are flat out crap. I, I mean, I'll say there's no kids watching this, right? Yeah. This is, you know, so that's the extent of my custom. <laughs> no, crap. you're good. <laughs> okay. So I think some of it was uh, just kind of wading through the sea of, of numbers and discovering what was the gold and what was the crap and uh, being able to find differentiations. And it's one thing just to be magnanimous and say, oh, well, I know everything. I'm gonna tell you. And I think, I think that's where we, a lot of young coaches look to older coaches that they figured it out. And I'm gonna tell you with some of the most seasoned coaches that I've talked stats with, or I've talked analytics with, um, whether it's statistics or their processes of training, whether they use body mechanics and um, some of them are full of it. And so I think everyone needs to constantly be asking themselves the question, why? And just because someone says it doesn't mean it's law or it's the rule of law. Like uh, I have been in many ways, and this is really Lambo's fault because he was my, the guy that I was structuring a lot of what I was going under uh, in terms of determining my processes. I'd be, I was an outsider because I wasn't doing what I thought all these other coaches were, were doing. And I, I initially did at first, but then, after a while, it wasn't working. And so either they trained it better than me or, or and I wasn't good enough at training what they were talking about or I didn't understand it. Um, but then I started finding ways as I measured um, that allowed me to train a little bit more. I think the biggest stats that I love the most these days are the ones where I measure myself and my wins or losses and my accuracy in terms of what I'm doing. And then it gives me a pretty good gauge of, wow, that doesn't work or this is working extremely well. And I think there's been some things that I've uh, stumbled onto that um, I'm not sure a lot of the sports do it. Maybe they are, but um, I think I'm trying to utilize it in, in different ways. And, and, and maybe I'm not, maybe I just, you know, but I do feel like in many ways, especially early on, I started out as an outsider. And uh, I think that was a benefit to me, honestly. Um, it was, it was cool. It was tough because you don't get to, be in the discussions like everybody else and just applauding and shaking your head. Yes. You, you were basically the person that says, what about this? And sometimes that makes you the smelly kid in class. It's tough being the smelly kid sometimes. Jesse, I think that's really cool. Especially the fact that you can kind of look back and, and see that you, you thought you knew way more than you did uh, back then. You know, you, you hear the, you hear people talk about, oh, I wish I could have known that when I was younger. And I, I don't think that you, we can get around that. I think hindsight's always going to be 2020, but it, it, it's really important, I think, that, that coaches look back at that. Um, I want to point out something that you, you talked about. You talked about box scores and how they don't, they don't tell the whole truth because it's just a, just a stat. I know um, 
I, I once played a team, we, we won in five sets. Um, we got out hit, we got out blocked, we got out dug, we got, we lost in every statistical category, um, but we won, we won three of the sets. So if you look at the box score, like, uh, how did this happen? So talk a little bit more about how that can be a liar either way. Like you said, you played way better or it can say that you played way worse than you did. Yeah, and I think the two that I, I really jumped towards, and I'll start off by saying this, the, the one thing in the box score that is the granddaddy stat of all of them is hitting percentage. And I would say the flip side of that would be opponent hitting percentage. Those are very stark in terms of uh, if you do what's called a, um, a correlation analysis where you have one column that says uh, the best hitting percentage to the lowest and the other side's you know, the winning and the losing, you'll find that the best hitting percentage will match up with the most wins and the lowest hitting percentage will match up, match up with the least amount of wins. And that's over the, over the long haul. You will have some outliers in there. And, and uh, if your team got out hit in terms of hitting percentage, um, I would say, and you won in three, there, there must have been some other dynamics around that percentage that you guys were being really successful at or they weren't as successful at, um, just to compare. But, you know, there's, there's always outliers in every game. The, the two stats that I look at in the box score, um, well, I'll, I'll say this. There's, there's three points. Number one, box scores have very limited population. And population is just the amount of data. Population is the math term. And it's just, there's, there's so little. Uh, so, what, so you know this, so like we'll uh, get a set one and then all of a sudden some team takes a timeout and it's like eight or nine points in. They'll come over with, the, with the, a box score. And I, and, and I have people just like staring at this thing. And I famously at all the groups, I, I get it and I throw it under my seat because I don't want to be swayed by a small amount of data. And, and that's one of the biggest things is um, there, there's a term in math and it's called central limit distribution theorem. And basically that's going to say, what's the minimum amount of numbers that will give any population weight. And that number at the very minimum is around 30. So you need about at least 30 or so chances just to get a basic minimal uh, understanding of what it is that the stat you're looking at. Anything less than that, then it's a pretty shaky stat it may not have enough weight to actually be a statistic. Um, I can tell you that, um, and here's, these guys are both similar. Um, let's start out with, we'll start with the easy one, digs per set, okay? Um, digs per set to me is a crap stat. And the reason why, and you'll see, and you'll notice that most conferences will have their libero of the year be the highest dig per set kid. And it's like, oh, this kid must be amazing. Coincidentally, for some reason, that kid is usually on one of the worst teams. Weird. How is this, how is this possible? Well, well, it's very easy. Take that same team, whatever the team that Libero's on, and look at its kill percentage. And if the kill percentage, and kill percentages will range anywhere from 30 to 40%, okay? That's, that's the norm. You look at any conference in the country, uh, and you take all the kills of all, out of all the teams in that conference, it'll be between 30 and 40%. Take any team out of that conference 30 to 40 percent take any high ball hitter non-metal 30 to 40 percent and those the non-metals carry the weight because they have the most attempts so um so what you start noting the kids that have that are the liberos of the year with the highest digs per set are also attached to the teams that can't score so if i hit balls at you and you get to hit more balls at me because i can't score then i'm gonna have more chances to get digs and my dig percent dig per set stat gets lowered on. Well, that's crap. I mean, you're getting rewarded because your team isn't offensive. I don't think that's, to me, that's it's garbage. You know, I think more, a more valuable stat is digs per attempt, right? What's that percentage at? When you get a chance to make a dig, do you make it or do you not make it? But in order to do that, you're going to need to have total digs, which um, is a stat that, and this is the other part of the box scores is there's some information that we do collect and there's some information we don't collect. So um, my, my next stat, which I think is crap in the box score, uh, and this is gonna be the one that's really jarring, is the uh, blocks per set. And I like when I, when I listen to coaches talk about you know blocks, a lot of times we, we say it in these hushed tones because it's like, you have this secret, but um, you don't wanna say it so everybody knows it. I think in this case, it's you have this secret, but you don't wanna say it because everyone's gonna look at you stupid, like you're dumb, you know? and um, if you look at blocks per set, they usually also tie with the highest blocks per set 
with the teams with the lowest kill percentage. So the, the reasoning is once again, because you can't score, you're then getting more opportunities where your opponent hits balls at you and you're getting extra chances to get those blocks. So if you have a low kill percentage attached to the blocks per set, if you have a low kill percentage attached to digs per set, um, then that's the reason why you're getting those numbers. It's not because you're amazing. It's because you're getting more chances. And I think that's, that's important to know. So, um, yeah. So it sounds like you're putting a lot of emphasis on, and I know you don't have a lot of data where you're at right now, um, but it sounds like you put a lot of emphasis on offense and offensive efficiency. And yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I think that's just the biggest one. That's the one that correlates the most to winning. You know, blocks per set does not correlate to winning. Um, Dicks per set does not correlate to winning. Um, hitting percentage correlates to winning for sure. And um, it's been that way for a while. So until someone debunks that statistic, that's going to be one that I base a lot of information off of because it's foundational. You know that at the fundamental, uh, uh, at a fundamental level, it's going to give you a pretty good indicator of who's winning the match and who's not. Um, and of course, it could be different. You know, maybe uh, and Kevin talked about his team may have not been great on that in that day, but over the long haul, if you're if you're efficient and you're hitting, um, you're going to win a lot. So let's, let's start equating that with practice gyms you've been in and how you're using those stats. So I think there's maybe two ways to look at it. How are you using those stats to think about what you're going to do in the practice gym? And or are you taking those stats in practice to continue to help them improve at that? Yeah, and I would say um, uh, yes and yes. And we're taking stats in practice and we are looking at that as our – as our main indicator, but I think more so we're teaching perspective, you know? And so let's just do an experiment real quick, okay? Um, with you two, I hope you're ready in front of all your, your whole club. And you guys are t tenured coaches, these guys, you two. <laughs> I, I have a lot of respect for both of you guys. You guys both know that. So um, I'm gonna ask this question and you guys might get it off the bat, but I'm gonna say most coaches don't. And I mean, at the highest levels, most coaches don't. So if I said to you two, okay, out of five attempts that your team takes, how many of these five attempts have to be, must be a kill? Three. Three. What do you got, Kev? Two. Two. So let's start with three. And what we're going to do to make the math easy is we're going to take the five, we'll double it to ten. And so your three becomes six. And I'm going to tell you that it's not an Olympic team on the planet that hits 600. If we do the same thing with the two, we double that to four. And there's, I think a couple of men's teams last year grazed the 400s and went right back down again. There's not an Olympic team on the, on the planet that averages 400. So the answer must be one. One. And one out of five or two out of 10 is, is 200. And that kid starts on nearly every division one, division two, NAIA, D3 team in the country. That is a productive player. That kid is good. Now, that's just an example. My actual denominator is different. It's seven for my college team, okay? But I would say for your club teams, I mean, do you average 200? Does your teams average that? That's, a, that's a, something to think about. It's not as easy as it sounds. So, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask this question to you guys, just sheer economics. It doesn't seem like the kill is really what we're doing here. I mean, what are these other four? What do you think? I can tell you, number one, they're not errors because then you're hitting for the other team at a starter's rate. So what are these other four guys? What do you think? Um, balls that are dug, balls that are blocked. You said it exactly right. Yeah. Ball, balls that get dug. So it seems like the job is more managing your opportunities and your situations than it is getting kills. That's a hard thing to swallow in volleyball. I mean, that's, that's not what our eyes necessarily see. That's not what we push as coaches. But I think in terms of perspective, it's important that everyone kind of is aware of that. Don't turn crap into more crap. And if you like it, those are the chances for you to go for it. So um, if all I could keep track of it, I would say as a club coach who was a math dork, data-driven dude, I would always keep track of my kills, errors, and attempts per player. And I always kept track of um, passing because you can find correlations to winning with uh, perfect pass percentage and error percentage 
uh, serve receive rating is definitely for me. Um, a, uh, it's a little flawed in, in my opinion because there's you can get a low perfect pass percentage and still have the same rating as somebody who has a high perfect pass percentage. You're still holding a 2.2 to 2.24. The kid with the higher perfect pass is definitely for me going to be on the court, and the other kid is close, but you got to be get your perfect pass up because it actually equivalents to winning at a certain point. Jesse, I think you touched on a lot of really good stuff there. Uh, one of them, uh, swing management. I think that is, that is huge and it, it is so tough to deal with because one of the things that stats doesn't tell you is they don't tell you what the set was like on those five attempts. And right. you talked about finding your time to be aggressive. The other times you are you're getting dug, but how do you get the other team out of system? How do you make them set their weakest hitters so that you can earn a point somewhere else? Uh, I thought that was that was really good. And then I really liked how you brought in the, the passing because when you're talking about stats that equate to winning, and you talk about you know hitting percentage, I think that that passing number is right there. Uh, I've been with a lot of teams that you know two three or higher, you're most likely going to win. If you're two two to two three, you have a chance. But if you're two three or higher, um, almost everything else looks good after that. The the attack percentage goes up because you're in better situations. But uh, talk a little bit more about um, that that two point three number. Two, two, I think you said two two to two four. Uh, somewhere in there, passing wise, and and what you guys do to kind of set goals through practice or uh, through games, and and also how you grade that, because I think that everybody, because that's a very subjective stat, everybody right. grades that a little bit different. Um, so for me, and, I, and I'm pretty rigid about this. Um, I would say I have like a half an eye, like a little ovalish around the 10 foot line. I mean, I'm sorry, around the jump circle. If you're at a basketball court in the middle of your volleyball court, that's around my threes. And then anything past that behind the, in front of the 10 foot line, it's a two. And anything behind that is a one. Now, if you overpass and it results in the end of the rally, that's a zero. If you overpass it and we keep on going, I'll give you a one. And a one is still not great. So it's not like that's like a, a huge bonus there. Um, I can tell you that some coaches have jumped into a four point system and some do three. Uh, I don't care. Um, I, I think um, I think if we're talking about um, passing for me. I have found that. So here's the other thing too: is you could take a you could take a two point three to two point two point two to two point four, and, and measuring once again correlation analysis versus winning, and it's not the most dialed in. It's very skewed. It's it's, it's up and down. But if you take a team whose perfect pass is fifty percent and higher, it is very skewed towards winning. And the ones who are, don't have that is, are losing. I would say I'll tell you minimum for every team I've ever coached, club or college, minimum. If we're not 50% perfect pass, we are working on passing more. And that's the reason why our team is, our opponents are edging us out. And so perfect pass percentage is just the threes and the fours or just all the threes divided by total attempts. And I have found that oh, the 60 percenters are the championship level teams historically. And what you could start looking at if you look into uh, some of the math is uh, every time you pass a three, your chances of winning, this isn't kill percentage, this is win percentage, is around 70%. Every time you pass a one, your, win, your chance of winning is 25 or so percent. And twos are around 50. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think for me, in terms of passing, what it, what it gave me was perspective on the teams that drive the balls first into the court, that are able to put some um, arm speed onto the ball and drive it, tend to win most because they're the ones that are in command. And let me just paint this picture real quick. I hit the ball and drive it into you, which puts pressure on your defense. You're going to dig it, and maybe you dig a two-dig a two dig rating, right? Or maybe it's a little bit off. Well, I just got to keep on doing that because I'm in charge. You're going to give me an easier ball back because your setter had to work and your hitter had an awkward ball. Maybe the angle over her shoulders makes her work a little bit. She can't line up the net, the block, the court, the ball path, and herself all together. It's really hard that way. Um, and so you're, I mean, that's, I mean, it makes a lot of sense in terms of that. Um, I'll, I'll get an easier hit to me. We're going to do it once again. We're going to dig it perfect again and do the process all over again. And so if all I'm doing is just driving balls at you and trying to make that process happen over and over, I'm probably going to win a lot. Now, other scenarios that you're going to see is if you drive balls at teams and if you put a little bit more smoke on them, you put above average arms, so your kid has some heat, you could drive a ball. If you drive it, you should just go look to go double block the, that outside hitter almost every other time because more often than not, 
that team is going to struggle and throw to their outlet player who is that left. And you're going to be in that scenario over and over and over. So um, some of this is just the stats that lead to the scenarios you're going to be in. Um, I can tell you that also if you pass perfect, you're going to hook a lot of middles, opponent middles. And that dynamic in itself, regardless of the opponent's block schemes, whether they're in the read or if they're front, um, that, that dynamic by itself will allow a little more one-on-ones to the pins. And, and that's winning. And that's, that's your chance to hopefully get a kill. But we talked about the one and five. More likely, it's your chance to drive a ball, and that's going to lead to success later on. Just give it some eight seconds or so. Let's dive a little bit more into how – I think – I'm struggling to figure out how I want to word this. Like, do the stats define who your team is? Do you use stats to push a team in a certain direction? Or do you use stats to say, hey, this is how we're going to win? I mean, I always tell the story of one of the more successful club teams I coached. Couldn't pass. I mean, we, it was an 18 team and, you know, the libero was pretty good, but they weren't serving on libero because we had two six foot two left sides that couldn't pass and they just kept serving them. And so we spent the majority of our time working on out of system attacking and we got really, really good at it. <laughs> and it, it. So, you know, at that point I'm using, it wasn't so much statistics, but a feeling, but we could have gone back to statistics to sort of reshape the team and figure out we're going to be successful. Or is it the other way around? Do you use stats in the college gym to say, this is who we want to be and we're not there yet. We need to get there. Yeah, I would say, um, well, number one, I would say if you measure volleyball, you're going to find that out of system play is predominant over in system play. So I think you talked about how your team couldn't pass, but I think that's just prudent anyway. That's just you being smart. You should be practicing out of system more than you practice in system, in my opinion, because that's probably what you're to be in. More. So I think that's important. Um, you, you touched on something, which is basically you realize a scenario you're going to be in a lot and you started picking on that. And I think that's the biggest thing is I like to try to throw a wide lasso and then slowly come in as we get better at some of the big concept stuff and then work on the little concept stuff later. So whatever the 50 percenter is, we're going to work on that compared to the 2% or the 1%. So um, I, I would also say this. I'm a big stat geek and I am built to be analytical. Um, so I'm, a, I'm, I was, I was a mathlete embarrassingly in, in junior <laughs> high, right? Like I went to that bungalow with the, all the other kids that have like these like inhalers and stuff and like the headgear that I'm like, man, this is, you know, and we, and I didn't know these guys outside of that. And my buddies never knew that I was in that bungalow because it was embarrassing, but looking, you know, now I use the bath a lot. Um, but I think I know that I'm built that way. I know that I'm very analytical and, and, and that side of me. Um, I have a degree in art, so I also have this other left brain side that I, I try to tap into in terms of just being okay with it not looking right or being abstract in, in terms of a, a, a thought or a concept. So um, I, I would say I, being aware of yourself is important, but just because I'm in a stat doesn't mean my players need to be in the stats. So um, statistics are not who we are. Statistics are the way to give us benchmarks to see where we're at so that we can determine the course of action to either grow in one way or work less on something else. Um, and I, I just think um, I have had the talk to my, my pins about out of five balls, how many have to be kills. And they all say, I mean, some five, like, come on, man, we're human, you know, or four. And if you start doing, you start talking about it and it's an eye opener for them, but it also is liberating because they start realizing there's a big kid concept, brain, brain concept that's going on, which is you need to determine what situation you're in and don't be dumb, right? Don't have, uh, if it's a blackjack term, you know, the, the dealer is showing uh, a three and a down card and you have an eight and a face guard, you're at 18, you're like, hit me. It's like, no one needs to be a hero here. Like, just, just put your cards down check let's see what happens odds are you're going to probably win that thing and if you don't win you do that again you're probably going to win more often than not you know so i think for me it's just a, a way of just having objectivity and i'm a pretty objective guy anyway um but it gives me a be able to see all right this is where i have to be at and this is where i'm going to striving for if, if i feel like my team is not championship level then i might shoot for the the next tier right below that so it may not be the top three teams or the top two teams, but it might be three, four, and five. And what are they doing? And do I need to try to get to those guys first? I think that's pretty big. 
So knowing those, their numbers, what are their hitting percentages at? What are their kill percentages at? How high are they erroring? You know? Um, and I think the other part of it too, is you're going to have a kid here or there. And I, and I do this more in the college ranks. I don't know if I would necessarily do this in the club ranks because my opinion in club is we should be playing these guys, right? Their, their parents are paying. Let's play them, get them better. Uh, I can't remember the seasons. I, I, I mean, I won some of the California seasons and stuff. I don't remember most of that stuff. I, rem I remember the kids. I remember, I don't remember a lot of the games, you know, and I remember the, I mean, we've spent a lot of time coaching club 10, 10 plus years, but I remember my kids more than I remember the, those guys. And, and I, I remember the kids I didn't play as much. And I'm looking back going, what kind of teacher was I that these guys hired me to be their sensei. And I, when it was time to fight, I put the kid on the, on the, the bench, you know, it's like, we've got to find ways to get those kids involved because that's a true measure of where we're at as teachers. So, um, in college, I would use the stats when a kid says, I, I had a kid in my, at Ferris that said, uh, hey, Jessica, I talked to you. I'm like, sure. She was like, well, I think I should be playing. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. God, yeah, it's great. It's great. And, and I'm going to say this again. I, this is for college, not for club. Right? And I said, all right, that's great. That's great. Well, who's going to sit? She's like, well, I don't think anybody should sit. I'm like, somebody's got to sit. If you're going to go in, someone can't go in. So who's going to sit? And she's like, ah you know, this big sigh. And I'm like, you get what I'm saying? Like, you have to beat somebody out. And these are the measures that we're going for. We're going for a perfect pass with a low error percentage. And how do you read up there? And, and I at least gave her a tangible goal that she was going to try to put the ball um, and serve receive as much as she could to target because that got her a chance to um, get in the game. And she was the kid that was just next to get in the game anyway. So it wasn't like it was like this huge turnaround, but it definitely put her focus on what she needed to really concentrate in terms of her process and uh, it got her a starting spot so good for her not that that has to be the it's you know this isn't a disney tale right it's like sometimes they don't get to play so but in club i think we should be trying to grow in our kids man especially especially the younger ages no absolutely i i agree with you completely and, and playing time is important for for development and you know everyone has to have that opportunity um one of the things i want, want to go back to what you said is you win more often than not. And I think that a lot of time stats are looked at as um, it's either this or it's not. You either hit 200 or you don't. If you hit 200, you're going to lose. And, you know, I think one thing that we talk a lot about in our gym is repeatable success, like being able to find somewhere and, and be consistent. And you talked a little bit about the, you know, having 30 – having 30 reps of something to give you some sort of data. Um, give some advice to, to some of the club coaches that, you know, they're, they're taking stats and they're seeing it and, you know, they kill this team because, you know, playing open the like first, first day, go out and you kill a team. And then you play somebody that's really good and you get killed and then you lose a close one. And how you, you don't have a full season worth of stats there like you do in college where the, you know, the teams you're playing are very similar. There's not usually a big difference um, in some of the tournaments, maybe. Talk a little bit about how those coaches can use those stats and equate them differently versus the competition that they're playing, maybe weigh them a little bit more one way or the other. Right. I, I, let me first start off by saying this is something I had to eat early on, but it gave me great perspective. And I had some great teams. I was winning a lot. Just because I win does not mean I'm good. Just because I lose does not mean I am bad. It, it, it's all relative. So uh, I, I can pat myself on the back for having the best kid in the gym on my squad or just be a little bit more, you know, it's like it, you can take the ego out of it and it gives you a little perspective in terms of your process. So I, I would say this, I, I don't necessarily look at stats during the day. I might look at it because, man, this kid's struggling. <sighs> I mean, but the law of averages says if a kid struggles one game, she's going to be amazing the next game. So food for thought, you know. Um, I, I would look at the end of the day and look at how our team did and how they've done historically and kind of and kind of compare it. So there wasn't no gut reactions one way or the other. I probably tended to lead kids in and give them a little more leash than maybe others would because I kept on trying to tell myself, be objective, be objective, don't jump to any rash decisions. I'll say this, though, in terms of looking at this stats if i didn't know you and this actually bodes well for the college game as well um especially in the club but in the college game this is my starting um well and, and anybody there is a little more differentiation in college but if i didn't know you i would block angle on both pins 
and I would promote the cutback from middles over and over and over because you're going to tend to get a higher, higher error percentage attached to a below average arm speed down the line when you make them hit towards uh, skinny windows, skinny lanes, and you're going to tend to have a below average arm speed with cutback from middles. So if I didn't know you, I'm starting off with that as my template. And then as I'm observing, I might say, oh, this kid's way more of a cutback attack. Well, we're going to force her at you, Libero, who's in left back. And now we're going to promote her to try to hit the ball towards that way, right? And um, if a kid, if a kid uh, is starting to just crush line side, I'd probably ride that out a little bit longer because sometimes, especially if the kid's well-versed and she's rangy. If she's rangy and well-versed, you might, or, might as well put her in a skinny window so at least you know where the fight's going to be as opposed to the other, you know, 800 square feet on the court. It's like, let's not have this kid, you know, attack heat at the fat part of the court. Make her attack heat at the skinny part of the court. And what tends to happen is they tend to take it off because they're aiming a little bit more and it allows, and they tend to air a little bit higher if they do go after it because the sideline is right there. And at least it gives our defender a chance to know, all right, it's supposed to come to me right here. So, um, I think if I didn't know you, those would be some tactics that I used. And part of that's because of um, having a better understanding of what blocking, you know, blocking and just how it, to, to, to take away a blocking stat, you just have to roll shot the ball over the, over the hitter. I mean, that's just, that'll instantly, you roll shot out to zone one or, or if your defense has the setter, you know, towards the template line, just roll shot over to her and there's no block to be accounted for. And you just negated that and put him out of system. So, um, I think for me, it's like, I found that I got more blocks. I found that my opponents had higher error percentage. And I also found that I solo blocked at a higher rate than just about my conference when I had those basic strategies involved. And we adapted them. Not everybody's that way. The kid's different. You have to adapt. You can't just sit there and take it. Not everybody's the same. But there's a reason why we have the term average. It's because most people do this, you know. And so I find that most people like to hit balls into the cross court because that's where they can put heat on it and most middles kind of hit with their right handed and they try to hit balls that way because that's where there's that's where the arm is attached to that shoulder and so um lefties are obviously a little different but um i think in general after after assessing the stats over time um those are some things that i've learned and obviously that means that i'm assessing where the ball gets hit and the hitting percentage kill percentage and arm speed attached to that attack per player. Yes, I think you probably have <clears throat> touched on all this stuff, but if you could just tie a bow on this and you're talking to club coaches specifically now, um, you know, what stats should they be focusing on, you know, not just in game, but for practice in terms of educating their kids on what's going on? Yeah, I, you know, there are two types of stats. There's stats that measure process and there's stats that measure our competitions and are a little bit more results-based. Um, I think you have to have both. So I am going to be in more of the results-based in terms of hitting percentage. I'm going to always know that stuff. I'm also going to want to know my opponent's hitting percentage, OPH. I think that's big. Um, kill percentage, error percentage. I'm going to know my perfect pass percentage and my error percentage in serve receive. Um, and then in terms of process, I'm going to, I'm going to work towards measuring and giving them I mean, I think you could find, you can develop drills that have process scoring in them where you're giving them love for parts of the process. Forearm dig, point. Perfect pass, point. Handset, point. Attack with an approach, point. And if you do that based on a certain amount of time and mix your teams up, you'll get, um, you won't get a number that's necessarily one you'd find on the box score, but you'd get a number that they could look at going, is that good? And you're like, I don't know, let's put another team in there and see how, how good or bad that was. And over time, that just allows them to kind of compete in different ways where they're not so, it's numbers, but maybe not necessarily results always driven. And you do stuff like that and you watch when the team beats the high score and you watch how they start going nuts and ah, ah it's powerful, man, I love it. So um, I would say if you're, if you're not into, to put a bow on it, if you're not into stats, your opponent, some of your opponents are, and they might edge you out. So you better be at least a little burst and um, develop your own sheets. And, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but 
it's okay to not know and to ask questions and it's okay to, uh, and I would tell them to see guidance with you guys as well. And, and just, uh, but even then just like, make sure you're also asking why and, and how much relevance that has. You can't just keep on regurgitating what the, the deemed experts have said in the past. If we did that, we would do exactly what they did. We want to keep on progressing our sport. And there's a huge opportunity in terms of analytics. I think, uh, I mean, that means we have to ask the questions why and is there a different or better way to do this and, and maybe there's not but at least we're searching for it i think there's it has a lot of merit i love it man i love ask the question why i think that's a great i think that's a lesson a lot of young and old coaches need to learn still but um good luck with your new situation i know this week uh started a really busy time for you so i really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our coaches that's some really really interesting stuff and breaking down analytics and process and i appreciate everything that you, everything you did for us today oh it's my pleasure guys i always like talking with you guys and uh um kevin knows i still owe him but uh we'll uh <laughs> I, I, looking forward to touching <laughs> touching ba base with you guys again and uh yeah one, my pleasure my pleasure yeah. jesse really good to see you man thank you appreciate it bud all right guys all right thanks guys